All right. You ready to do this? Let's do it, sir. All right. All right. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Bob Stark. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. You are welcome. So Bob lives off grid in rural Alaska with his wife and daughters, where they own and operate a small farm named Secret Garden Alaska. He joined the army at 17 and parachuted into Iraq during the 2003 invasion. He was the first in his family to graduate high school and college. Bob, welcome. Before we get going here, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. I was born in Caldwell, Idaho, and my mother moved my brother and I north to Nome, Alaska when I was about three months old. Oh, wow. So I've lived Hmm. in Nome, Alaska, Seward, Eagle River. I've been in Alaska my whole life. Wow. Wow. Um, Okay. Awesome. So uh, you have, you have that great vibe about you just very <laughs> warm and welcoming it's it's pretty awesome i gotta say so all right let me let's back up so why did you reach out to me i reached out to you into it be, yeah because i wrote a book it was called war flower and i had a close friend read the book and that friend is a host of a podcast and he listens to all different types of podcasts i really don't until very recently. And so he was really touched by my book and it helped him deal with different traumatic events that he had gone through while on mission as a Mormon. And he was able to show me these similarities between him going door to door in Australia and me going door to door in Iraq. And the way it touched him and he shared it with his son, he told me that I should really get into different trauma podcasts. And he said yours was one that he really liked. And so I sent you an email and here we are today. <laughs> what, do you want to mention his podcast? Yeah, his podcast is called Psychedelic Stories. Okay. And it's really interesting because he grew up in a very cookie cutter family very Mormon. And it wasn't until he was, I believe, like 28, almost 30, when he started looking at other possibilities that were out there. And he started digging deeper into the original Mormon beliefs and how they may have experimented with some psychedelics. So here's a young young man growing up in this religion, never used any substances, And boom, he starts realizing, dang, he's had depression his whole life, always on medication, and he wanted to try new things. So he Mm -hmm. grew his own little batch of mushrooms in his closet, and that started his journey into discovering the healing benefits of different psychedelics. So he shares those. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that that sounds like a story unto itself. Maybe I'll, I'll invite him on afterwards. But <laughs> let's. I want to talk about you. How did all this start for you? How, from the army to Iraq to, yeah. Well, I believe it all started for me as a as a child. With, I think back on trauma since this is a trauma podcast, and the first experience I remember of trauma was in the third grade when I was writing a story. Our teacher, Mrs. Bodie, had the whole class write a story from a bird's eye view. It was a one paragraph story. And in third grade, that was a big deal. And I sat down and I was writing and I was writing. And I remember all the my classmates came around me because I just kept writing one page onto the back. Oh and I was just like, <laughs> it's like everybody was cheering me on, you know, and We got done and it was time to read our stories. And I started reading my story and not even halfway through, Mrs. Bodie cut me off. And she said, that's the wrong perspective. It's supposed to be bird's eye view, incorrect. You get a zero. And that was, I hate to say it, Mm -hmm. of all the experiences, you know, from when I was in Iraq as an infantryman, through my life, my brother went to prison. My mother married a guy in prison. There's been a lot, but that one, really has stuck with me as not being good enough and always doing things wrong. And so I kept writing, but it was always a secret. 
And so here recently, you know, I started a book about 15, 16 years ago after I got done with my second tour in Iraq and I got out of the military and I was just spinning in alcoholic drug induced circles. And I just sat down in this cabin in Costa Rica and I just started writing and writing and writing. And two journals later, I had the first draft of what came to be my book. And so since then, it's been this journey of a little bit of sobriety, back relapsing, drinking and drugging. Uh, let me let me pause you for a second there. <clears throat> I don't want to get to that, but yeah, that sorry. that story of uh, that teacher doing that um, is really intense. It reminds me of an experience I had with art, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I can feel that you're not good enough, you know, and and, and you're so into it. You're writing and you're writing mm -hmm. and you're like in your zone and all these people are around you because they can feel it and see it too. And then someone comes up. So how did things lead you into the service? Man, I'm so glad you commented on that because that really does make an impact on my art today. You know, I have people who tell me, you're a musician, you're an artist, this and that. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm a practical man. Because still that weighs on me. But yeah, it led me into the service because I was getting ready to graduate high school in Seward, Alaska, and I had nothing going for me. And my mother was always talking very highly of men in uniform. And all of the military or all of the men on my mother's side of the family served in the military. And so you know, like I mentioned, my brother was in prison at the time. My mother was married to a guy in prison for life. And I was like, I just need to get out of here mm -hmm. and start somewhere new and build some confidence and to quit drinking and just freaking being so crazy. You know, I thought I was going to end up on, in prison. So where was your I dad? Joined, um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know at the time. I mean, came I came to learn later that he had lived basically in the woods outside of Corvallis, Bend, Oregon area for like 20 years. So oh, wow. he was kind of a homeless guy, I guess is what you call it. So, yeah, we didn't talk during that time. I didn't meet him until I was 25. But so I joined the army, you know, five days or three days after high school. I shipped out and I was trained in Fort Benning, Georgia. And then boom, I was in Italy. And within three months of being there, we were parachuting into Northern Iraq. And then the journey began. <laughs> what happened? Oh, just, you know, we were basically the, uh, we were the patrolling guys, you know, we were always in front of everybody, patrolled door to door, patrolling the streets, setting ambushes. Mm getting in fights, doing things that were very less than honorable. Fights and... meaning fist fights or gunfights? No, gunfights as okay, in, yeah. you know, they blow us up and yeah. next thing you know, we're shooting at each other and and that deal. So mm. and so that led to more experiences of not so much pride, which I had hoped to join and receive or earn. It was more of, boom, now I'm out of the army four and a half years later, have terrorized people, innocent people in their homes. I have a divorce under my belt and I'm still mm. an alcoholic who's depressed. And so it didn't do for me what I had hoped it did. Wow. Wow. When, when you were in the service, what was that like for you? I mean, aside from the, I mean, it sounds horrific mm -hmm. um did you thrive in the camaraderie did you yeah definitely you know i'm glad you bring that up because it's easy for me speaking of trauma to look at all that negative but the truth is that it did so much good for me mm -hmm. joining the army because i had no structure before i really had no discipline and I had never really known a tight brotherhood like I did while I was there. And so it did so much for, for those aspects of me and to give me some purpose. And so when I got out, after I got 
through some of those different challenges, I was able and still today to like wake up at a certain time, make my bed, mm -hmm. go to work, you know, get those those regimes, if you will, in to place. So it did a lot mm -hmm. of good, man. So you did you were in there four years. Yeah. Two tours in Iraq. What happens when you get out? Where do you go? How are you? Yeah. Yeah, I got out in from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And, you know, I, I was I returned from Iraq two weeks prior. So boom, I'm back. I'm on the street and I'm alone. And I remember nobody would answer my texts or my calls. I was just like, so I didn't know what to do, where to go. I had money in the bank and I just started driving from Fort Campbell, Kentucky West to visit my mother in Arizona. We went on a road trip together and then I returned to Alaska where I tried to get into a healthy rhythm, like find a job, mm -hmm. go to EMT school. But I dropped out of all those things because I was just drinking and smoking bud every day. That finally, thankfully, my family was like, we need to go to Hawaii. And they brought me to Hawaii. I stayed there for a few weeks before I bought a one-way ticket to Belize. And then I spent the next year in Belize, Guatemala, and Costa Rica, where I started kind of rebuilding, not even rebuilding, building some confidence and love for myself and practicing yoga and meditation and being sober and learning Spanish. And so it was, if it wasn't for that, just a kind of spontaneous one-way ticket down South, man, I don't know where I'd be. That changed everything. Was it, was it like an intervention? Did the, your family say, dude, you need to clean up or what, what, what was it that helped you say, I need to get my act together? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think there was anything that said I need to get my act together. It was my family at that point, they had witnessed what was going on and they were planning a family reunion in Hawaii. And I was like, no, I, I can't go. I, I'm too busy here. You know, I wasn't doing anything. And they ended up getting me really drunk and bought a plane ticket with me. And then I was committed. And when I got down there, it was just like, you know, winter in Alaska can be rough. And all of a sudden yeah. I'm in Hawaii and I'm like, Oh my gosh, eating healthy. And then it re sparked that. Oh, yeah, I joined the military because I wanted to travel. I have money, I can travel. So it just kept me going. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That was about it. So, talk to us about the, the genesis of this book. Oh. And, and what's it, what's it called? Um, the book is titled Warflower. A True Story of Family, Service, and Life in Alaska. And gosh, my wife is so much better at doing the elevator pitch, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have time here. You don't have, you don't, yeah. have to be a 30-second thing. But it's basically about the events that led to me joining the, the Army. Me, It's broken into two sections, two parts. And so the first part has, boom, we're in Italy, we're packing our rucksacks, we're getting ready to jump into Iraq, and then we're in Iraq, and the things that happened there. And then those chapters are broken apart with some really quiet, nature-based moments in Alaska, hmm. and then it goes back into war. And so it goes back and forth like that for about half the book. And then part two is me getting out of the army, the day I get out and that road trip that I go on with my mom. And it's a lot of mental and kind of trying to rebuild love for my country by traveling and, and those little encounters with the waitress and mm -hmm. the person at the gas station sell me cigarettes and, and the loneliness and fear before and during the military and then the loneliness after. And so, and then the epilogue or, yeah, epilogue is today, you know, so mm -hmm. it ends kind of on like a, dang, that's depressing, like what happened? But then there's the epilogue, which is all these things have happened. And now I'm here today. And I'm just so lucky to have the life I have. 
at, at what point did you sit down to begin writing the book? And and you, when you sat down to write, did you say I'm writing a book about such and such? No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Yeah, I think if I were to do it again, maybe I'd outline it, but I needed to do that. And, you know, I was house sitting a place in Costa Rica out in the jungle by myself. And I just I had this welling up of emotion that it didn't matter how much physical labor I did. It was still there. And so what, what talk about this? What emotion? What kind of emotion? Um, I think there was just so much guilt and shame and fear of going to sleep because of nightmares and then looking even deeper back to feelings of abandonment from my mother who chose the murder in prison, my brother who chose to be in gangs and, and my country, because I felt like they didn't care about what I had done, about what my soul, my comrades had done. And so really I just hated myself. Mm. I hated it felt like I hated everybody. I didn't trust anyone because of all those, those experiences. And so I was just isolated because of the fear that every human that entered my life seemed to carry of, Oh God, you're going to hurt me again. Are you a good guy? Are you a bad guy? You know? So those were some of the emotions that I tried to numb at that point. I wasn't drinking much, but I just smoked bud all day. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd tell myself, oh, it's because I have nightmares, you know, but then I'd wake up in the morning and smoke butt all day. So it's mm -hmm. like it, it became a habitual thing. So so those were some of the emotions I, I was trying to hide from. How did you work through um, and 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 how are you working through all of these emotions now? Gosh, at that point, it was starting to write. I didn't know what I was writing. Cut it out. I didn't know what I was writing. I just knew that I had to write. And once I put pen to paper, I was that boy in third grade again, who wasn't thinking about anything besides mm. my pen flowing. Mm. And it gave me such relief that I could sit there for hours and my pen would just go and go. And I didn't read any of it until later. I just kept writing and writing. And, and then at, later on, I, traveled to India. So I put that story away. I returned to Alaska. I, I commercial fished. I started working. I was able to go to EMT school, hold jobs. Like it helped me so much to get that out. And I was practicing yoga every day at the time, Ashtanga yoga. So it was really intense stuff. Um, but so I, I got it out. And then later when I was in India, I did, a, it was like a 13 day silent Buddhist retreat. And, you know, that was like going through these forgiveness meditations and mm. visualizations of the people that I hate it. You know, these guys who killed innocent people. And I'm like, oh, my God, I was a part of that. And working on forgiving them, forgiving myself, telling myself it wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. And then I got on the computer again and I was like, I'm going to just start writing an email to myself. And that lasted for a couple of years, just writing and writing and writing. And then later on, I hate to keep going. I finally got those journals out and I was about to start typing them to add them to that story. And they were basically the same story. <laughs> the one that I wrote in Costa Rica was very vulgar and full of finger pointings and this and that. You know, I was so full of rage at the time. The one later was a lot less violent, just the language and the mm -hmm. finger pointing. It was more of just like an observer's view of what was happening. And so I kept working on that when I got rid of those old ones. And, and still today, you know, the question being, what do I do? I grow a lot of food. I write. So I work with my hands in the dirt. Um, I try to write on a regular basis. I play music and sing, and that gets some of that out of there. Um, I try to be a good member of my community. I don't use any drugs and alcohol anymore, thankfully. 
And yeah, man, I just work on my present moment awareness, you know, dude, you are, you're a writer, you're an artist. Of course you are. <laughs> what, what, what do we, what does the culture need to hear about? people like yourself who've gone to war and are coming back. I mean, sadly to say, we hear this, right? This is not new. But what what are we not hearing? What are we not getting? Uh, If I had the answer to that, I think I'd be well known on all the news platforms and a millionaire. But I do think a lot of it is is understanding that most I don't want to generalize that many of the soldiers who are returning from war zones or even not they and we all need a little more than just a veterans day we don't need the parades. We don't need, you know, the people holding flags and having us march in. We don't need to sit at the Legion and tell stories. I think what we need is to come back into our societies with a purpose mm-hmm. similar to what we had. And we can use that determination and that grit and that discipline for said purpose but it's so hard because when we get out, it's so wide open. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, you got money for college, but you've got all this violence that you've gone through and that you still see people like. And so, you know, I wish there were, as they say in the, the healthcare world, like a warm handoff. And I know they're doing (laughs) some of those things today, but you know, to be someone there to greet the soldier who gets out, and have a team of people that are like, here, let me help you with this and that. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, that we did go through some violent stuff, man. I think people see that on the movies and they think like, oh yeah, that happened to whatever that Chris Kyle, but it's just for the snipers or it's just mm-hmm. the Rangers, man. There were, you know, girls who were supply sergeants who were doing patrols that were getting blown up. It's like, man, there was so much violence every day and it's hard to just like shake it off. So, so yeah, for the families, not to keep rambling, but for the families, it's like me, you know, I have a hard time. My brother was in prison and it's very, very difficult for me to give him the space to be angry, to be sad, to be depressed, to be all those things because I want to fix him. Mm -hmm. I want to make him happy. Come on, Mm -hmm. man. (laughs) And I think that's a lot of what the culture wants to do is we want to give you the medicine. We want to give you the counselor. We don't want to give you the space and time that it may take you to start a healthy routine of daily existence. So you're now, as I read in your bio, in rural Alaska, off grid. You've got a family yes. <laughs> and yes. you, you have, uh, is, are, are you married? I am. Or are yeah. you a partner? Okay. How did uh-huh. you meet your new, your new partner? Um, I met her. She was working at a, a bakery in Homer, Alaska. We're on the Kenai Peninsula. She was working at a bakery there and I met her. I met her there. Okay. And you have yeah. two young kids. Yep. Two daughters. <laughs> awesome yeah um and and so what you you have this farm yep so how did you acquire this yeah so back in 2012 i came back to alaska after i was in college i went to a uh evergreen state college a liberal arts college and that changed my life completely um but either way i returned home i still had some money saved And I wanted to buy a piece of property because I had the dream of a family farm. 
and where I was living in Seward, Alaska, there wasn't much for property. You could buy like a quarter acre, but it was all really expensive. It wasn't good soil, not good sunlight, blah, blah, blah. And I was looking around the peninsula because I love it on the peninsula. And I found this unfinished house on 20 acres off grid. So I say rural, we are on the road system. But if you were to drive out here, you'd think, does anybody live out here? Right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the price was right at the time. I was able to do for sale by owner, owner financing. So I put the money down and in 2012, moved out here with my brother and we started the journey of learning how to build and maintain a house and mm. start a farm. And so it's been a slow going process. And I tell my wife all the time that, you know, before she came into the picture, I didn't have any pa solar panels. I didn't have any batteries. I was just a guy with a headlamp, a couple candles, and it was quiet out here. When I asked her to marry me, she said, yeah, only if we get a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um so you said this is you're new to podcasts. This is oh yeah. What do you what do you want? Who's the book for? First and foremost, the book is for me. And now I've been so surprised, man, because ever since it's come out, you know, I've had ninety plus year old women reading it and commenting to me on how much it helped them to understand the men in their life and the boys and their emotions and that they've bought it for their like 90 year old friends and then i've had 20 and and down 16 i had my uh a 14 no 13 year old niece read it hmm. and she said you know, similar things. Oh my God, I can't believe that our family has done all this stuff and that you, my happy uncle, that's what she calls me, has been through this stuff. And so, you know, I think more than anyone, it would be for, for veterans mm -hmm. and their families, anyone who's been touched by people going to war and what they've gone through. But I think it could also very much be for like my counselor who read it and told me, Oh my God, this has helped me to understand mm -hmm. more of what all of you vets don't talk about. Mm -hmm. And so I don't mean to say it's like this broad book, but when I was told to put it into like this genre, like what's the audience is really hard for me to narrow down the audience. So you've been through a hell of a lot in your life. You've been through, um, what I think a lot of people would say, a lot of traumatic experiences. Was that difficult for you to say, to recognize, to own? This was traumatic to me. This, Gosh. what was, talk about that. What a great question. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I was, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago. I don't remember when. And I was seeing it as a conspiracy at the time. I, I saw it as the government is going to just give me this check and diagnose me and try to give me medication just so I would isolate and shut up and never tell anybody about things that happened. And so that's what I did. I did that for years. Mm. And then I ended up getting a counselor. And man, bless this lady's heart. Whew. I got her. Her name was Kim down here in, in the Nilchik area. And she really convinced me. She told me, you know, thank God her husband was an AA. And I was not. I was a non-drinker at the time, but I wasn't in any kind of recovery or anything like that. And, and she 
asked me to tell her one story. And I told her one story. And it wasn't even like the most violent story. It's just one story. I thought it was like a normal everyday thing when we were over there. And she she looked at me afterwards with tears in her eyes and she said, Bob, if the ordinary American <laughs> would have gone through something like that, <laughs> you know how that would affect them? She said, all of you guys come back from Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, Grenada, all these places. And you have so many stories just like that one. But you know what all of you veterans say? I was like, what's that, Kim? She said, you guys all say that the other guy had it worse. Help the other guy. Mm -hmm. Help him. And the sooner you accept that you've got post-traumatic stress disorder, the easier your life's going to be. And I remember going home from that being like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I don't have no PTSD, you know, just like, <laughs> and then over the coming weeks, I started really ruminating on that and looking at some of those experiences that I'd written down and, and realizing, you know, maybe all these symptoms that I've got are from those experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not just like damaged goods. Like, there's a reason that I am acting in this way. And so that really was the beginning of me starting to recognize some of those triggers that were coming, some of my actions, ways to have better self-care, if that's what we call it, and to maintain a healthy mind, body, and connection with my spiritual guide, whatever you want to say. And, and those have helped me tremendously. No, oh. but it took accepting. Yeah. Yeah, man. You are so inspiring, Bob. Really? Um, yeah, you are. No, no. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. You just a little bit. Um, really? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's incredible to listen to what you've been through and to how you worked through it. And it, it, obviously it w w wasn't easy. And I'm, I'm don't expect it to be at all, but um, I think it takes a lot of guts to uh, come on a, a podcast like this and and share your guts, share your soul, and to even to write about it. You know, I really appreciate it. I think you're going to have you. a big. You're welcome. I think you're going to have a big impact on a lot of people. You know, and um, I'd love to have you back. You know. So hopefully this won't be your first time on a podcast. You definitely come back on this one. Um, where can people learn about the book? My family has a website. And so if anybody's interested in reading our, our blogs, if you will, newsletter, whatever you want to call it, um, they can go on our website and it's secretgardenalaska.org. Okay. And they can buy the book from there. Um, they can go on Goodreads or Amazon to look at the book okay. and re read about it. They could order it from different small Alaskan companies, bookstores, and support the little guy. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's where they can they can find out about that. Okay. We'll have it linked up book. here uh, at the show notes at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. The book is Warflower. A true story of family, service, and life in Alaska. Um, so what's what's next for you? Well, my neighbor just stopped by with tears in his eyes and told me he needs help putting in sono tubes because he had a heart attack and he can't really do it. And this is a tough guy. And so I'm gonna get off of here. I'm gonna go split a little bit more wood to help me. Whew, and then I'm gonna go to his house and help him with that. What are sono tubes? Sono tubes are, you know, what a lot of foundations, instead of like having a concrete slab, it's like a four inch or eight inch tube that you fill with concrete. Oh, okay. And then you put, you know, your beams on that. Okay. And that's what you build. Okay. Right, He's right. building a house. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, man, really appreciate uh, you coming on here. It's, uh, it, it's great to talk to you. I'd love to have you back. Very nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Be well. Bye, guy. <laughs>